Well, I welcome you all to this 19th Eucharistic Convention. Very holy looking congregation you are. And um, on your behalf, I'd like to thank John um, Porteous and Bill and the huge team that uh, work to produce the convention each year. And I'd like to welcome especially those, of those who will be speaking to us during these days. You're going to be formally introduced and welcomed later this evening, so I won't name any names now. But we welcome you and thank you for joining us. And we pray during this Mass that God will, will use our speakers over these days to touch our own hearts. Now, in rather a selfish sort of way, I'd like to welcome especially those of you who don't live in Auckland. Welcome to the city of Auckland. And I want to say a few things about Auckland, not skiting, because I've got a point to make. But um, the mayor of Auckland, Len Brown, is always talking up the city. And um, he says some quite interesting things. He says that things we know in a way, like Auckland is the largest Polynesian city in the world, but another very interesting thing, he says that Auckland is one of the ten most ethnically diverse cities in the world. Isn't that amazing? That it's home to over 160 different nationalities. He tells us that the population of Auckland will grow by another million over the next 20 years. The point is that Auckland, but it's really New Zealand too, is becoming very ethnically diverse. And the, the theme in some ways for the, con the theme for the convention is, is talking about the mystery of the Eucharist, an antidote to modern life. But it's all part of the great challenge of the new evangelization. So we're a very ethnically diverse city and nation. Even with the priests, at the end of last year I was preparing a report for the Ad Limina visit and I was counting up the priests in Auckland, and um, there are 165 priests working in Auckland, but what's really interesting is that we priests come from 20 different um, countries of origin. Anyone like to guess? 93 are born in New Zealand. They're the majority. Would anyone like to guess where the next biggest number come from? Ireland, wrong. <laughs> Philippines. Yeah, the Philippines, and guess what the other one is? Begins with S. Samoans. Okay, Samoans and um, Philippians. <laughs> Filipinos. 13 from each. What's, what do you think would be the next group? Begins with I, and it's not Ireland. Where? India. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Nine from India, six from the UK, and actually I'm one of those because I was born in the UK, um, raised in New Zealand. Um, but, uh, and then five, I was saying this to the priest and I said there's five from Ireland. One of the Irish priests came up and said, who are the five? And I said, oh, it's last year, <laughs> there's four now. <laughs> but it was just um, interesting, isn't it, the mix. Now, many of you will know that the great challenge facing the church at present is this call for a new evangelization. That's a phrase that John Paul II began to use, the new evangelization, and Pope Benedict has really taken it up with a vengeance. And you may know that there's going to be a synod of bishops in October of this year. Guess what the theme is? The new evangelization. Pope Benedict has set up a new office in the Vatican. Guess what that is? The office for the new evangelization. And what he says is he says that um, he contrasts the new evangelization with what he calls first evangelization. And he says first evangelization is where missionaries go where the gospel's never been preached. That's first evangelization. Bishop Pompalia coming to New Zealand, for example. Francis Xavier going to India. Um, first evangelization. But what the Pope says, the great challenge facing the church is, is preaching the gospel in cultures where the, where the gospel has been preached, but everything's going a bit cold. The flame is flickering. And 
Pope Benedict says that, that this calls, it's a whole new ball game. And he says it calls for new methods, new techniques, new enthusiasm, new zeal. It's a whole new ball game. And he says first evangelization is very important, I'm not putting that down, but the, the real challenge for the church now is this, is this preaching the gospel in cultures and countries where it has been preached and it's all getting a bit cold. And Pope Benedict has, has, is launching a year of faith, he's calling it, running from October this year through to the Feast of Christ the King next year, 2013. He's really wanting us to examine our faith, to deepen our faith, to live our faith, and to share our faith. Now here in New Zealand, the messages are very mixed. In some ways, we're a very secular society. We're told that in the census in New Zealand, for people in their 30s, born in the 1970s, 50% are ticking no religion. 50% of people in their 30s in New Zealand, they look Catholic, Anglican, Methodist, Hindu, no religion. Oh, that's us, no religion. They're ticking no religion. It sounds a bit alarming. Yet on the other hand, with the World Youth Day celebrations, young people are being attracted in their millions. Here in New Zealand, with our own Catholic school system, we have 65,000 children in the schools and we know parents are queuing up to try to get their children in. So we think, well, what's going on here? How secular is this society? In some of the schools around Auckland, they have a weekday mass, you know, when the chaplain comes for mass. What's really interesting for me, in some of the schools at the, at the voluntary weekday mass, they have attendance in the hundreds. And you think, well, what's, what's all this about? Sacred Heart College, they have something like 600 students come for the weekday mass. It's voluntary. You don't have to be there. What? These are very mixed signals. Last Friday was Good Friday. I was part of the um, Stations of the Cross from the seminary to the cathedral. But almost a thousand people, and most of them young, was organized by the university students. But again, very interesting, isn't it? The challenge of the new evangelization. And I mentioned the ethnic diversity of our culture, our society, because in some ways that's a sign of hope. And I keep thinking, the challenge of the new evangelization, we shouldn't think that's an issue that they're going to solve in Europe. I mean, they'll be trying to solve it, but maybe where, where, where it can happen. Now, last month in Australia, there's, there's a newspaper called the Australian Financial Review. All of us economists buy copies of that, you know, find out how business is going. The Australian Financial Review. Now, last month, they had, they had an article by Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who's the chief rabbi in the UK, in Great Britain, a two-page article in the Australian Financial Review, and the article was entitled, Why Religion is Important for Society. But isn't that interesting? A, a newspaper for financiers has this huge article on the importance of religion for society. What's that saying? And in this article, Rabbi Sachs, he has very interesting things to say. He says, he talks about how religion seems to just keep making a comeback. And he mentions in China, 50 years ago, Mao Zedong declared with great pride that, com that China was a godless society. No religion. And Rabbi Sachs says that in China today, there are more practicing Christians than, than there are members of the Communist Party. Isn't that interesting? And he goes on, he says, it's very odd, he says, when you think about it in modern society, that religion doesn't just die out. Because he says, he said, you know, if you want to explain the world, we've got science, you don't have to go to the book of Genesis. He says, if you want to control the world, we've got technology, you don't have to pray. He says, if you want to prosper, you don't need God's blessings, all you need is the world economy. Well, he might be thinking twice about that at the moment. But he said, if you're sick, you don't go to a priest, you go to a doctor. 
If you're feeling guilty, you don't go to confession, you go to a psychotherapist. If you're feeling a bit down, you don't turn to prayer, you take a Prozac tablet. And he said, if you're looking for salvation and happiness, you don't need to go to a cathedral because you can go to the shopping malls <laughs> and everyone gets a bargain. <laughs> but he's sort of saying, you know, in the modern world, why do we need religion? And yet he says, religion survives, religion flourishes, and he says the 21st century is going to be an age where we're going to see a, a whole renew of interest in religion. And he makes the points, he says, that basically religious faith addresses three questions that human beings ask day in, day out. Who am I? What's the meaning of my life? And how do I live? How should I live my life? What's it all about? And he said that human beings are meaning-seeking animals. That's what we need. Before anything else, we want to know, what's the meaning of my life? What's it all about? It's quite a nice little phrase. He says, science takes things apart to see how they work. Religion puts them together to show what they mean. So, and he sort of says we need both. And that, that was what John Paul II used to say. You know, in that beautiful encyclical of his, Faith and Reason, he opens it and he says that faith and reason are like two wings on which the, the human spirit rises to the contemplation of the truth. We need faith and we need reason. And Pope Benedict is making the same point. The theme for the convention this year is the Eucharist, the antidote to modern ills. And the greatest modern ill that people can face is that their life might have no meaning. That's anathema to the human spirit, a meaningless life. The English poet Sally Reid is an English poet, and she had a very interesting little ref reflection lately. She said she was brought up as an atheist. And she writes beautifully. This, these are the words she said. She said, I was raised an atheist. She said, I was brought up an atheist. The creed of non-creed was in my blood. That's the way I'm wired, non-creed. She said, Christianity was a symptom of bigotry or feeble-mindedness. But she said, as a young woman, she said, I admit I did try to believe in God and I went to a few um, churches, but it didn't click. And so she felt when she was about 20, she thought, God does not exist. And then she adds this. So as a 20-year-old, she says, God does not exist. Clear as crystal. But she adds this. She said, I remember the dull sadness that came with this realization, something of the color gray. She said, okay, the creed of non-creeds in my blood doesn't make sense. I don't believe. And she said, I had a sense that the whole world just turned gray. Now, Sally Reed was actually received into the Catholic Church just a year or so ago in the Vatican. And she, she has these lovely words. She was writing on this mystery of faith, and she said, it's been said before, being Catholic is like being in love. As a poet from a most secular culture, I have come to know the Church as the ultimate poem, an intricate composition of allegory and reality that tries to give image to God's presence on earth. Being a Catholic is like being in love. Last Friday was Good Friday, and, and we experienced the grey emptiness, the grey silence that followed the death of Jesus on Mount Calvary. During Easter week, that's the week we're in, we have all the technicolour Easter appearances of Jesus risen from the dead. We're called to a life that's not a life of grey dullness, but a life that is brimming over with hope and love. And right at the heart of this life lies the mystery of the Eucharist, the living bread come down from heaven, the body and blood of our risen Lord and Saviour. So let's as we move into the convention this year, let's really just take note of this great mystery of the Eucharist, the antidote to modern ills, especially that modern ill of illness, 
life has no meaning. The message of the gospel is exactly the opposite. Life is full of meaning. We're the sons and daughters of God. He wants to share his life with us in all its fullness. And right at the heart of our faith lies the great mystery which we celebrate this evening. May God bless us all. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.